Hello everyone, uh, here uh, to continue onwards the last bit of the semester. Uh, I know it seems like a lot of information, it seems like it's gone very rapidly, but we have made it almost to the end of the semester. Uh, just our last sort of discussion on the reproductive system. That's, that's all that remains here. So uh, I'm going to look at the reproductive system collectively, and then we'll split it up into the female system and then the male system, right? But there's some similarities, but lots of differences. Um, collectively, we say the reproductive system plays, uh, you know, some major roles in uh, the sexual behavior, the sexual drive, and then obviously the, uh, the ability to sort of pass on our genetic information to the next generation. So that's the whole purpose of the reproductive system. Uh, all of the other systems have a life-sustaining role, right? Your heart needs to beat for you to function. The brain needs to function uh, so we can maintain consciousness. Uh, the kidneys need to function in order for us to survive. The reproductive system can be gone and we function perfectly, right? Uh, so the reproductive system, kind of a selfish system. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't do much to help the... Uh, sort of the survival of the individual, but it helps to maintain survival of the entire species, right? So helping us to uh, have the interest in reproduction, the ability in reproduction, and the sort of uh, coupling with uh, 1306 concepts like meiosis, uh, Mendelian genetics, and all of these things which help then allow the next generation to flourish. Uh, with the actual reproductive system, we're going to look at the anatomy, the physiology, but understanding that uh, this system is very, very dependent upon the endocrine system, right? So we're looking at uh, the idea of the testosterone. We're going to talk about sort of the estrogen effect, the progesterone. So uh, there's a lot of necessity from the reproductive system to be in communication with the endocrine system. And these hormones uh, help in the maturation, in the sexual development, um, in the libido, right? the, the sex drive. Um, and, and they, again, help in fertility to allow for the reproductive process to occur. So testosterone, um, I, I know it's kind of polite to let uh, ladies go first, right? Ladies first, I know that's the polite thing, but we're going to focus on the male system first because male system is actually simpler. It's less complicated than the female system, right? So let's look at the male sort of system and the effect of testosterone. So testosterone uh, is going to prompt what we call spermatogenesis. So at puberty, uh, we have this uh, sort of secondary uh, sexual response that happens, and, and testosterone is is key in that process. So we start to pr uh, produce sperm at, at, in puberty. Um, all of the accessory organs uh, will will be affected. Right, we're going to talk about what that means in a bit. Uh, testosterone will have multiple anabolic effects, so causing the growth spurt, causing muscle development, uh, sort of that that oily quality that you're pubescent little brothers are going through right now, I guess, the deepening of the voice, maybe. Um, uh, just behavior, that sort of that, that, that sort of sex drive that kicks in, the libido. Uh, and again, not many stranger things on planet Earth than a pubescent boy, right? Uh, your little brother, your little cousin going through puberty. They smell of puberty. Uh, they get kind of creepy and, and sort of secretive and this kind of stuff. And, and that's sort of this uh, sort of change in their body that's happening as testosterone increases. We might actually see some, uh, some increased uh, competitiveness, aggression. That is also an effect of testosterone. So the male reproductive system uh, begins at the testes testicle one, testes uh, plural. So the testes are going to be found within the scrotum and their job is to uh, be stimulated by the testosterone to produce sperm, right? To undergo spermatogenesis. Uh, once sperm is produced, it will travel through a series of ducts, right? 
So we're going to see the epididymis, the ductus or vas deferens, the ejaculatory duct, and that familiar part of our anatomy that we've covered in the urinary system, which is the urethra. So the male system uh, actually borrows anatomy from the urinary system. Right? So we have the reproductive organs and the urinary organs, so reproductive anatomy, uh, urinary anatomy that are both going to be used in the male system. It's going to be different in the females. So accessory glands, uh, accessory sex glands are going to uh, release their products into the uh, into what we call the semen. They're going to contribute to the semen and are going to empty secretions into the ducts during ejaculation. These accessory sex glands include things like the seminal vesicles, the prostate, and the bulbourethral or Cowper's gland. So we have then the primary anatomy and then these glands that are uh, secreting their products into uh, sort of the ejaculatory process here. Uh, this is analogous, it's very similar to what we saw in the digestive system, right? So if you remember the duodenum, uh, we're getting the chyme from the stomach, but then we're getting also this uh, these substances from the liver, the bile. We're getting the pancreatic enzymes, the pancreatic juice. So multiple substances are starting to, to sort of interact to help the digestive process. Well, in the reproductive process, we're getting something similar. So we have the actual sperm, uh, but we're going to get then these, this addition of uh, different secretions, again, from the seminal vessel, seminal vesicle, prostate, and the bulbourethral glands that we collectively call the accessory sex glands. All right, so kind of a, a lateral view here, but we see our starting point, which is the testes housed within the scrotum. Uh, then we see this sort of uh, uh, aggregation right here, right? The epididymis all this sort of reddish part, the vase or ductus deferens, kind of goes, loops around. Uh, and then at this point, we team up with our, again, our urethra. So you see the urethra. And then out through the penis there. So this is the anatomy of the male system. The accessory glands being the ejaculatory duct. Or I should say the dumping their products into the ejaculatory duct. Here we have the seminal vesicle, the Cowper's gland or bulbourethral gland, right? and then the prostate. So these are all parts of the male anatomy. So the scrotum basically has an important task. Um, in order to maintain fertility, sperm has to remain cooler than body temperature. Uh, one way to diminish fertility is to let the sperm get too hot. Right? So sperm has to be maintained about three degrees centigrade lower than core body temperature. So how do we accomplish this? So the scrotum is basically a pouch. I'm sure you can envision the pouch that uh, basically hangs outside of the uh, the abdominal pelvic cavity. So the, the scrotum basically will be able to uh, regulate testicular temperature by moving the testes either closer to the core or farther away from the core. And that's the job of the scrotum with the sort of uh, the complementary muscles that we're going to look at here. So the scrotum, I don't know what happened to my slide here. So, um, I'm not sure why it skewed like that, but uh, the scrotum is going to be um, regulated by two important muscles, right? So something that we call the dartos muscle and the cremaster muscle. So again, smooth muscles, so out of voluntary control. Uh, you don't have a say in the matter. The, 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 the brain processes and, and adjusts accordingly. So we have, again, these two sets of muscles that will wrinkle the scrotal skin and uh, the cremasters, these bands of muscles that will elevate the testes. So uh, basically, uh, if you go back to mythology, 
uh, we have some mythological individuals, um, uh, these old Greek sort of uh, characters apparently were in charge of um, lowering an anchor or picking up an anchor, depending on the scenario, right? So again, that's what my, my pictures were trying to show here, right? So kind of like lowering the anchor or raising the anchor, that's the job of the dartos muscles. But they're not lowering or raising anchors, they're lowering and raising testes, right? So that's sort of the, the analogy there. So again, a frontal view. So again, we have our testes housed within the scrotum. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but the epididymis then kind of looping up around through the prostate gland and then through the penis, right? So sort of the anatomy of the, the frontal view of a male. So the testes, uh, um, tunics again, tunics become this repetitive type of idea. Um, what I want to get to right here is this idea of this seminiferous tubule, right? The seminiferous tubule is the actual site of, of sperm production. So within these tubules is where, where the body, where the male body manufactures sperm. So the sperm, once it's uh, formed, again, is going to be conveyed through the seminiferous tubules. Uh, enhanced by these uh, Leydig cells, which are making androgens. Androgens are the male-based uh, hormones, the androgens, the testosterones, th these kinds of hormones. Uh, there's the tubulus rectus, the rit testes, uh, efferent duct ductules, and the epididymis. So it's a lot of little anatomical parts uh, that are in charge of making the sperm, uh, allowing sperm to mature, to become functional, uh, to be housed, and then to be sent through the path. So, um, again, there's our testes, our seminiferous tubules, where the sperm will be produced. Ret means like a, a net. A red in Spanish is like a net. So we have this little net work of, uh, of little vesicles here. So the seminiferous tubule, sends the sperm to the reet. Uh, we're gonna go up then into our uh, sort of epididymis. And we're gonna continue to mature through the process until we're ready to be uh, sent upwards. So you can just see microscopically, right? We're inside the seminiferous tubule where the little sperm are starting to undergo their meiotic process and the maturation process. So the penis, the penis is basically the male copulatory organ. Um, this is uh, what will be introduced into the female system uh, to allow for internal fertilization. Um, and basically the penis consists of the root and the shaft that ends in the glans penis. Uh, the foreskin at the tip of the glans penis and some religions, some cultures undergo the circumcision process, which is the removal of the foreskin to expose in the glans. Um, let's see, so the penis is going to be comprised of what we call spongy urethra. So we talk a little bit about spongy urethra with the urinary system. Now we're going to get into more detail. So the penis comprised of spongy urethra, which is going to allow for both urine and semen uh, release, and three cylindrical bodies of erectile tissue. So the spongy network of connective tissue and smooth muscle with vascular spaces. So erectile tissue is basically hollow space that can become engorged with blood, and that will then allow the uh, erection process to happen. So what are these erectile tissue? We're gonna call them the corpus spongiosum. Surrounds the urethra and expands to for the glands and the bulb. And the corpora cavernosa, paired dorsal erectile bodies. So there's again, uh, gonna be three uh, spaces for blood to 
kind of flow into the penis, sort of get trapped there in a sense. Uh, so not, uh, uh, not kind of like with the, uh, the lymph nodes where we have more fluid coming in than leaving out. So causing then that backflow and the engorgement here. So the erection uh, happens when blood flows into the corpus spongiosum, the corpora cavernosa, uh, the erectile tissue, which are these two, fills with blood, causing the penis to enlarge and become rigid. So erection. So to kind of give you a little picture here, right here, we see the spongy urethra. So that's part of the urinary system borrowed by the reproductive system. So again, both urine and semen will pass through the spongy urethra. So why do they call it spongy urethra? Because it's surrounded by the corpus spongiosum, kind of in this uh, blue coloration. Corpus uh, spongiosum, and where's the other one? Again, our, this is a better kind of a cross-sectional view. So our corpora, our corpora cavernosa and the corpus spongiosum. So these three hollow areas that um, make up again our erectile tissue, right? Corpora spongiosum, corpora cavernosa. And again, all of these are within the penis, right? So they're within the, the penis, they're not farther back, yeah? So the male system, again, starting at the testes, sperm stored, uh, completed sperm uh, stored in the epididymis, passed through the ductus deferens, out the ejaculatory duct, and then out the urethra. So the epididymis, we kind of talked about a little bit, but um, this is when the non-modal sperm, so not mature sperm at the moment, pass slowly through and become modal. So this is where sperm matures within the epididymis. Uh, during ejaculation, the epididymis contracts, expelling sperm into the vas deferens or ductus deferens. So there's an actual uh, contraction of the epididymis, which allows sperm to move upwards. And again, at this point, it's, it's basically just sperm, right? There's, uh, there's not a whole lot of extra fluids at this point. It's just the, the mature sperm then that will be released. So the, the mature sperm will travel through the ductus deferens or vas deferens and it will propel sperm from the epididymis to the urethra. Now uh, a type of birth control for males would be to undergo a vasectomy. Right? And why vasectomy? Uh, because it's going to be the clipping, the cutting of the vas deferens, also known as the ductus deferens. Right? So if we're literally cutting and sort of ligating these, these tubes, uh, sperm will be produced, but sperm will not be able to be released out of the body. So cutting and ligating the ductus deferens or vas deferens uh, is nearly 100% effective form of birth control. So again, you always wonder why not fully 100%? Well, like they said in Jurassic Park, right? Life finds a way. There's a, a few rare cases where males have undergone a vasectomy uh, and they still then father a child later in life. So, but again, nearly 100%. It's a very, very minimal chance of having a child uh, if a male has undergone a vasectomy. So the cutting of the ductus deferens, again, understand this idea. So we're not affecting the testes at all. We're not affecting the epididymis at all. Uh, sperm is being produced. Sperm is maturing. It's just not being able to be uh, ejaculated uh, out through the, um, through the ductus deferens. Uh, urethra, again, sort of using two systems anatomy, right? So the urinary system and semen, but it cannot use them simultaneously. So it's either one or the other. And the urethra will be sort of surrounded by the prostate and the prostatic urethra, the membranous urethra, 
and then the spongier penile urethra. So going back to the urethra. So urethra is starting here in the males. So those are trigone. Um, here we have then the beginning of the urethra that passes through the prostate gland. And prostate gland is completely uh, encircling the urethra. We pass through the membranous urethra. And then this long area of the spongy urethra. Right, so uh, surrounded by the erectile tissue of the penis. So uh, for males, very minimal aspects, very minimal risk, very minimal complications with the membranous urethra, with the spongy urethra. Uh, but some issues develop normally as men age with the prostatic urethra. So as that prostate starts to increase and it gets larger, well, it gets larger this way, but it's also compressing this way into the urethra. So if there's an enlargement of the prostate, it starts to squeeze and compress, squeeze and compress, and it then narrows the, uh, the urethra not allowing urine to pass effectively, right? Or uh, uh, semen to pass effectively. So that's the structural anatomy. Now let's look at part of the accessory glands to the male system. So the accessory glands include, again, one, the seminal vesicle. Seminal vesicle will produce this uh, viscous alkaline seminal fluid. And basically, this is the nutrition for the sperm. These little sperm are going to have to swim. They're going to have to kind of navigate through the female system. So they need a source of energy. So uh, this viscous alkaline, and, and again, why alkaline? Well, because the female's uh, vaginal area, vaginal canal, vaginal tract uh, will be very acidic. So trying to neutralize the acidity, uh, we have some alkalinity here. So the seminal fluid basically is then the, uh, the nutritional source providing fructose, uh, coagulating enzymes, ascorbic acid, prostaglandins. So again, allowing the sperm to have a little bit of, of a fuel source to navigate through their journey. And again, this is going to be about 70% of the volume of the semen. So when ejaculation happens, it's not 100% sperm, right? There's a lot of other fluids uh, as well. So the duct of the seminal vesicle joins the ductus deferens to form the ejaculatory duct. And I don't know if I have a picture of that. Let me backtrack way back here. Uh, does it show it well? This one shows it a little bit better back here. So back, backtracking way back. We see here our ejaculatory duct, and here's our seminal vesicle. So this fluid will be released into the uh, prostatic urethra right there. Right, so that's an important uh, junction there. Go back to where we left off. The prostate, the prostate again is very critical in fertility as well. So it will encircle the part of the urethra inferior to the bladder and secretes a milky, slightly acidic fluid, uh, more enzymes, uh, different antigens. All of these play a role in the activation of sperm. So once the sperm is subjected to these chemicals, the sperm is right now we know we're, we're, we've been ejaculated. Uh, we know that we have to go swim and find the egg. So that's sort of the, the, the cellular communication to these little sperm. And the prostate secretions enter the prostatic urethra during ejaculation. So again, not really showing it good there. But we will have the prostatic urethra that enters or secretes its, um, basically its, its, its substances, right? Uh, all of its uh, fluid, 
uh, into then the urethra as well. Um, all right, so uh, we look at the seminal vesicle, the prostate, and now the Cowper's gland or bulbal urethral gland. Right? So bulb, like a light bulb, urethral, uh, the urethra, right? So that, if that helps a little bit. So it's a pea-sized gland, like a little, a little pea, pea-sized gland inferior to the prostate. So this one works before ejaculation. So um, kind of like when um, you know that you're going to get some food, our, our salivary glands start to uh, you know, sort of generate saliva. So based on um, learned responses, based on sort of just autonomic processes, same kind of thing with the bulbo urethral gland. So prior to ejaculation, this Cowper's or bulbo urethral gland produces thick, clear mucus. So it's kind of preparing uh, the glands, preparing the penis for uh, sexual intercourse, and it's actually lubricating the, the area. And again, since we're going through the acidic environment of the urethra, since urine is slightly acidic, uh, basically we're going to neutralize any traces of acidic urine there as well. So, again, not really showing it too well, but there's our seminal vesicle, the prostate, all the little prostatic ducts. And here, right there, you can barely see it, the little bulbo urethral gland, which is dumping its product uh, into, uh, again, the urethra. Bulbo urethral duct opening. Kind of goes inferior to that and comes out right there, comes out right there. So when everything is said and done, right? So everything's been primed, lubricated by the bulbo urethral secretions, uh, then we're ready to secrete the semen, right? And semen is a mixture of sperm and all of the accessory gland secretions. It contains the energy source, uh, contains different protective uh, chemicals, and uh, basically the prostaglandins are going to be a way of making the female system a little bit more, a little bit less harsh, a little bit more easy to navigate through, right? It's gonna cause reverse peristalsis in the uterus. So that way the sperm aren't having to sort of uh, swim all on their own. So with reverse peristalsis, the female system actually can help the sperm move up uh, through her system. So semen, again, alkalinity neutralizes the acidic, the acid in the male urethra and the female vagina. So pH becomes important. Um, there's clotting factors that coagulate semen just after ejaculation. Uh, so it's sort of going to be a, a protective sort of coagulation, and then that breaks apart and allows the sperm to, uh, to be in the optim optimal position to start their, their journey. Now, if you're wondering how many sperm are ejaculated, right? So only about two to five mils of semen are ejaculated. Of those two to five mils of semen, there's about 20 to 150 million sperm. So you can imagine, wow, like all these sperm. And only one of those, if, if, if it's going to fertilize, only one of those 150 million are, are going to make that, that fertilization process, right? So you can think, wow, it's... Uh, it's a tough, it's a tough life, tough chore for, for the sperm, right? There, there's a lot of competition. Uh, if you've ever applied for a job, well, we have some competition, but this is 150 million possible sperm that you would be competing against if you were a little sperm cell, right? So when you look around and you, when you see people and you think, wow, that you're the product of that one optimal sperm that made it. And for some people like, wow, that's awesome. And just saying some others like, man, that was you know, the, the, the top of the line. Well, uh, that's, that's how it works, no? So the idea of numbers here. Now, male sexual response, um, erection. Um, erection, 
we know is uh, sort of from the realm of physics. If you force a lot of fluid into this area, it's going to swell up, right? And it's going to cause then the erection to happen. So enlargement and stiffening of the penis from engorgement of erectile tissue with blood. So what can initiate erection? Right? It's maybe common for most males. It may be a little bit unique for some males, right? But uh, whatever the male uh, sort of responds to what the male considers to be sexual stimuli. It may be a touch. It may be just the thought, right? And the imagination triggers uh, uh, the erection. Uh, mechanical stimulation, right? So uh, erotic sights, so visual, uh, sounds, auditory, smells. So the different senses can uh, sort of lead to this erectile type of, of function. Now, since there is a neurological component to erection, uh, erection can be induced or it can be inhibited by emotions or higher mental activity. So maybe the male is super excited. Oh, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Or they start overthinking. They start analyzing. They, and so again, um, the, the erection itself is controlled by the realm of physics, but it is sort of linked to the, to the emotional state of the individual as well. So it can be induced, can be made to happen, or it can be inhibited. Can, uh, a male can get too nervous, too stressed, too excited, and, and not allow that erection to, to occur. So erection, uh, again, is parasympathetically controlled. And what, when is parasympathetic uh, sort of dominant? When we are, or we are relaxed when parasympathetic control is, is occurring. So uh, if the male is relaxed and calm and in, in the moment, uh, they typically have a little problem inducing an erection. Again, if they are too excited, if they're sympathetically stimulated, which seems kind of weird because if you know a lot of activity and uh, the idea of oh this is going to happen this is going to happen uh, basically it would make sense that we shift into the sympathetic stimulation but sympathetic stimulation is not conducive to uh, to erections yep. so parasympathetic reflex promotes the release of nitric oxide right nitric oxide causes relaxation vasodilation, which allows more blood flow to occur. So nitric oxide. Um, nitric oxide is a relatively simple uh, molecule. Um, and basically, there's some companies, some pharmaceutical companies that have made a lot of money by packaging nitric oxide in a little pill, right? Um, if you've heard of like things like Viagra, Cialis, all those pills do is enhance uh, the release of nitric oxide. So they're, I mean, they're more complex than that, but basically they're little nitric oxide pills and they then help to um, vasodilate. So even if the person is nervous, even if the person is in sympathetic control, we still have that vasodilation and uh, erection can happen. So um, again, if for whatever reason, because of stress, because of um, decreased amount of nitric oxide, a male cannot uh, generate an erection. We say that that male is impotent. They're suffering from impotence uh, or, or erectile dysfunction, they call it. So the inability to uh, attain erection. So inability to attain or to sustain an erection, impotence. So uh, let's say that everything worked, worked well, erection was there, uh, we have ejaculation. So now we have propulsion of the semen from the male duct system. Um, while erection is from the parasy parasympathetic role, ejaculation is sympathetic. So it causes a synchronized uh, contraction of the ducts, uh, the release of all the accessory fluids from the glands, uh, the bladder sphincter will contract, not allowing the semen to enter into the bladder, uh, but out through the urethra. And again, there's a rapid series of contractions. It's from the bulbo uh, 
uh, spongiosus muscles. So it's not just one sustained contraction, it's like, a, a, again, the, the repetitive type of contractions. The sperm, sperm maturing in the testes. Uh, so again, kind of backtracking, sort of zooming in. I should have probably put this slide when we're talking about the actual sperm, but uh, just understand, understand sperm has three main parts, the head, the midpiece, and the tail. So the head, which contains the DNA, the midpiece, which contains all of the mitochondria that are going to generate ATP to wiggle in the, the tail, the flagellum. So sperm starts out here, undergoes a maturation process, the development of the flagella, the tail, and again, we're ready then to, uh, to, to go fertilize an egg. So uh, again, with that, I think that gives you a, hopefully a good idea of how the male reproductive system works. And that's gonna be a basis for comparison when we get into the female system. So it's gonna be some similarities, but again, a lot of differences, um, different cycles that are gonna happen also with the female system. So, so keep an eye out for that, uh, which will be our last discussion. Uh, I think I'm gonna have to break the female system into two uh, lectures, because it's a lot of stuff to cover, but we're almost done, right? Almost to the end of the semester. So I'll let this one start to process and keep an eye out for the, the next lecture.